I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart and praise your name. When I called, you answered me. You will make good your purpose for me. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. 
In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. The word of the Lord. Let's read the psalm together. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name because of your love and faithfulness. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. When I called you, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord. When they have heard the words of your mouth, they will sing of ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. To the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O oh Lord, my love endures forever. Do not abandon the words of my hand. A reading from 1 Corinthians. I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, and through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James and to the apostles. Last of all, as one ultimately born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, 
I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. This time I welcome our youngest members to come forward. We're going to try on some outfits. So you may have wondered, or maybe not, uh, you might be interested in other things, but you may have wondered what all of these outfits are about and what they mean. So you'll see on any Sunday or feast day or any holy day that we come together, every person who serves at the altar wears a white robe, and that is a symbol of baptism. It is our garment of baptism. It says that we are baptized and that everything we do flows from our baptismal identity. And then some of us get to wear colors. So this is one of the things that our dear friend Janie, who is in the congregation today, has crafted for us. I think this comes closest to being a cope, C-O-P-E, a cope, which is a fancy churchy word for coat because through all the centuries in the unheated cathedrals, it would be chilly. And so the ministers would wear copes. They would wear heavy coats. And I wonder if one of you would like to try this one on. All right, Coretta was the first to stand and we're gonna share. So one of the requirements of wearing a cope is that you have to share it with your friends. And I see there's a line forming. So this cope is the Advent cope. So it is a symbol and a sign of hope. The color blue, the deep indigo, the lighter blue. It reminds us of the dawn, about just before the sun rises. And so we begin our church year with abundant hope. Hope that someone is coming to save us. And it can cover small things too. Advent is the color of hope. Then at Christmas, I'm not going to let you wear this one, and I'll explain in a minute. I would not so burden you with it. <laughs> at Christmas, we go to white and gold, mostly white. Again, white is a symbol of baptism, a symbol of incarnation, a symbol of gladness and joy and rejoicing. So this is our Christmas color. It's also our Easter color. So on our biggest days, on our brightest days, we wear our most splendid garment, even though Janie has crafted one more splendid still. I'll show you that in a moment. Does anyone want to guess? Ah. Sorry. Uh, what season this Chasuble belongs to Teresa. So you can wear this during Advent, that's right. Advent has a variety of colors in the cool spectrum, so you can use a straight indigo or blue. But the older color that has been used in Advent is purple. There's also a shot of rose or pink that we use usually on the third Sunday in Advent. But this also is a garment for Lent. Purple, purple dye, indigo dye, was the most expensive ink in the ancient world. And so when we wear purple in Lent, it's a sign of the royalty of Christ, that he comes to us as a king, which is odd because what happens to him is not very kingly. He ends up being executed by the state. And so it's ironic, it's a broken symbol. And so Lent is the season when we wear 
a royal color, a splendid color, but also a very solemn color. So this is a solemn season. It can sometimes even be melancholy. And so we have room in our year to explore some of the darker and harder things in life. Speaking of which, what does this look like? Yes. It looks like a cross. What kind of fabric? Is it a silk fabric? It's rough. It's not splendid. It's kind of ordinary and plain. Sometimes we grandly call this Lenten array. But it's also just called a rough fabric. It also has wording on the back. I'm not sure about this particular chasuble. I don't know its, I don't know its origin. But it could also work for Holy Week, the week that we mark the death of Christ. So it has a subdued feel to it, right? So Coretta, we're coming close to having a new hope to try. So I wonder if you can share that one with your brother. Do you mind? May I? And everyone who wants to wear one will get to. What is this the color of? Yes. Red. It could be a Christmas color, yes. Blood. Sometimes it's called ox blood, but I don't know if ox blood is any different color than human blood. I think that's just a highfalutin way of saying it looks like blood. So this is the garment that the priest wears on the sacred three days, the three days of Christ's death and resurrection, the Passover of the Lord. This is our Holy Week chasuble. Again, look at the simplicity. So we go down into a more subdued and solemn time before we return to white and gold. So I want to try this cope on someone whose last name is not Yoder, just out of fairness. Who else would like to be clothed in a garment, please? It's a very grand look. I believe that that is a gold cope or coat for Easter. It has festivity all around it. Yes, you can do that. It makes you less likely to trip. Then, on the last day of Easter, on the 50th day of Easter, we wear what I think is the most splendid chasuble I have ever seen. Janie outdid herself. What do you see? Flames. Fire. The fire of the Holy Spirit. This is the day when God sets us on fire. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> We're set on fire with passion and energy to go out into the world, to proclaim things, to tell people things, to tell them good news. It's a tremendous chasuble, an immense gift, glorious. One more cope. What color is this? Yes, Coretta. There is some blue in it. Is that what I heard you say? What else do you see? Turquoise? Green? At two times in the year, we can wear the color green. Green is a, is a color of growth and flourishing. It's a summer color. Even in autumn, there's a harvest be harvested, and so green can be our color in autumn as well. Green is a color for what we sometimes call ordinary time. The great long months of the year 
when we don't have a lot of festivals, but we just rejoice together. Who wants to wear green, please? And finally, we come to this green chasuble. And I want to use this one to teach you what a chasuble is all about. If you can see, and this was true with the red one and the white one and the others, a chasuble is defined as one garment. This chasuble loves to mess with my microphone. One garment with a hole in the middle for the head. And it echoes the garment that Jesus wore that they took off of him before they crucified him. And they cast lots for it. And so the chasuble is a way of saying that when we come together, we become the body of Christ. We take on his garment. Our Jewish cousins taught us that the garment that a priest wears is called love clothing. It's the clothing, it makes me cry. <laughs> It's the clothing that a priest wears to signify that she loves her people. She loves them. It's love clothing. And so the first priest, Aaron, took off his love clothing and placed it on his son before he died. The thing about this, though, is that it's not about the person wearing it. It's about the whole congregation. The whole congregation is a kingdom of priests. And so no priest is a priest except by the authority and permission of their congregation. And so it is that the people put the love clothing on the priest. And that's what I would like to invite you to do. I would like you to place this chasuble on me because you and not I have the authority to do that. And the way we're going to do that is hopefully not going to be complicated. I need at least four of you. I'm not, is that a hat? It's a cupcake. I'm not sure what that signifies. So you're going to place this love clothing on me as a way of saying that you are the body of Christ. You are the assembly. So I'm going to kneel down. And you come toward me. with microphone. Now I am ready to serve you. Thank you for that honor. Enjoy your copes. At some point, you'll have to turn them back in, as will I. Many blessings to you all. Thank you, Janie.
the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. How can God get your attention? How can God lock eyes with you, literally or otherwise, and truly get you to listen? I've recently told a couple of people in meetings that when I was in seventh grade, my English teacher said to my parents in a conference that Stephen could be looking directly at me, and I can tell he isn't listening to a word I'm saying. <laughs> this is a cute little story, and yet no one I've told it to expresses surprise. I want to hear you. I want to listen to you. But it's hard sometimes. I have a lot going on, and so do you. Sometimes what you're saying doesn't come across very well. Sometimes I look up several hours later, maybe while I'm waiting in line for the ferry, and I think, damn, what did she mean by that? Did she mean what I think she means? I want to pay attention and get what I'm being told on the first hearing, but I get distracted. Or you say something distractedly or indirectly. We're both caught up in other things and the connection is lost. Or one of us doesn't want to hear it. Maybe I can't get your attention because you don't want to hear what you suspect I have to say. If so, I can relate. Incidentally, if you feel God is calling you to the priesthood, you have my sympathies, because all of this becomes even more complicated and overwrought. Lots of people wonder if God is actually calling you, or if your sense of call is just your projection onto God of your own human desires, your own anxious hankerings. You wonder that yourself sometimes. This self-doubt can actually be a healthy practice. One must be very careful when saying that God is speaking. That belief has all too often led to body counts. But God is calling us, and the good news is never, ever just for those with the misfortune of feeling called to be deacons or priests. The call is extended to all of us, in different ways, if only we would listen, if only we would pay attention, if only we would stop and breathe and turn our heads and get ready to hear what God is saying. But that's rarely easy. Often enough, most of us don't even see the value of listening to God. God seems to be silent. If God is here, God is not visible and rarely palpably present. 
Most of us are not mystics, and if we're honest, we don't really think God speaks to us. We live in an era that has diagnostic categories for people who hear disembodied voices, and we are enmeshed in a practical post-enlightenment mindset that does not assume that a deity would communicate with us. I expect that scarcely any of us in this room or online feel called or expect to feel called by God to do a mission or serve a specific purpose. I suspect that we are, all of us, co-workers of Simon, washing our nets after a long night of futile fishing, resigned to the grim fact that today is just another day. I know I'm a valuable person and I matter to many people, but I often doubt that I am called. I don't seem to be one to whom the risen Christ appears on the road, dazzling and terrifying. I don't seem to be one to whom Jesus of Nazareth appears, conjuring astounding wealth from nowhere. Wealth that threatens to sink the frail boat of my short-sighted imagination. I'm just me. We're just church. We sing songs. We often have fun together. We have an open door to the stranger. But called? That sounds a little evangelical. <laughs> a bit embarrassing, even doesn't sound like us. But I tell you this. God wants to get our attention. I mean it. No joke. God is calling you, calling me, calling us. Let's explore some ways of finding out what God is saying to us. Let's start with abundance. Ask yourself, what is filling my fishing boat fit to burst? What is my impossibly stupendous catch of fish? What is my immense gift, my prodigious talent, my deepest joy, the thing I do with ease and delight, the thing that doesn't feel like work, the thing that makes me feel full, the thing that makes my heart sing? I recently shared with our treasurer, Terry Jones, that an accountant I hired years ago told me that when he traces the X and Y axes of a spreadsheet to the corner and discovers that everything adds up, he gets a warm feeling. <laughs> this is his joy, and it should not be overlooked or minimized. You're a poet or you're a painter, you're a physician or an accountant, you're a parent or a godparent, you're a 12-step sponsor or a city administrator or the world's best auntie or the most serene and breathtaking oboist. Or it's not something you do, it's just something you are, like a true, tough, yet tender friend. Whatever it is, it's your boat bursting with fish. It's God's abundance overflowing in you. Then, okay, once you have an idea about your particular abundance, consider what might be going on around you that you can't shake, you can't ignore, you can't stop worrying about or wondering about. It could be a deep and terrible social problem. And if so, then God has blessed you with the gift of prophecy, you can show us how to solve that problem. You can be the oboist or the administrator or the godparent who rouses us and empowers us to tackle that problem. Or maybe it's just one precious life God is calling you to save, one person Jesus would have you fish for, one addict who needs to be taken to a meeting. One lonely soul who hasn't yet heard the beauty of your music. 
One child who needs a strong parent. One parent who needs an excellent babysitter. One coworker who needs an office friend. You discern your great gift, and you discern a great need. This can be how you hear God's call to you, God's call to the delightful creation that is uniquely you. Maybe there's more than one call, come to think of it. I was an organist before I was a therapist, before I was a deacon, before I was a priest. May you not struggle that much. But through all of that career development, it may be that my first role in life is where God calls me most powerfully into ministry. I may ultimately be called to be a good brother to my siblings. I have faltered in this calling. But it's one of a very few golden strands that will run through the entire tapestry of my life. And my boat groans with a bursting net of six siblings. God is calling you. God is calling all of us together. God in Jesus sits in our boat, surprises us with abundance, and calls us into mission. Does God have your attention? Together, let us affirm our faith. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of all humanity. Knowing full passion, deep sorrow. He died for sin. He descended into the earth, to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present. And his kingdom will one day be known. We believe in God within us, the Holy Spirit of Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church. She is the spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection, and of life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for Claire and Hope Flesher as they prepare for holy baptism. O star of wonder, we pray for the world, all nations and all in authority. O dawn of justice, 
we pray for the earth and for this community, island, and region. O Son of Righteousness, we pray for all who suffer and all who are in any kind of trouble. We pray for healing for Jeff, Elaine, Nancy, the people of Tonga, Ellen, Rose, Layla, Sherry, Mark, Carol, Terry, Barbara, David, Tim, Ted, Elizabeth, Charles, Stacy, Glenna, Nell, Beverly, Mary Ann, Brian, Marguerite M, Carson, Julie, Doug, Mike, Len, Susie, Ken, and Dina. We pray for support for Jim, Barley, Marshall, Maddie, and Augusta, Fred, Raul, Ronald's family and friends, Mark's wife and Donna, Kathy, Andrew, Mario, and Susan, Eddie, Robbie, Darren, and Brooke, Gary, Alyssa, and Ashley, Tracy, Sarah, and Lauren, Beth, Steph, Maggie, Scott, Debbie, Sue, Barbara's family, Glory, Susan, Martha, Robin, Dave, and Allison, Gordon, and Bruce. We pray for peace for Marianne, Mark, and Sharon. And we give thanks for the life of Susan. O beacon of mercy, we pray for all who have died and for all who mourn. O fire of resurrection, on us. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
himself for us, an offering and sacrifice Amen. to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God, through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, holy one of blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy. Yeah. 
because your word has never been silent. You call the people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, gather us with all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God.
midst of the darkness shining, Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence. From the shadows into your radiance. By the blood may I enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Say Let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. At this time, I invite all who would like to celebrate with us a birthday or anniversary to please come forward. Show yourselves. Speak. It's on. 
celebrating my granddaughter's 10th anniversary on the 12th of the month, next Saturday, and I will be there to celebrate. Great. I am here to celebrate an anniversary because on February the 1st, six years ago, I got to spend time with a baby named Coretta. And then four years and three months after that, I got to spend time with a baby named Roscoe. Wonderful. God My friend you. from school has a birthday next week. Wonderful. <laughs> we also have those joining us online. Uh, Pat O'Rourke's grandson is turning, which is Stephanie here, uh, turning eight tomorrow. Wonderful. The youngest of my 19 nieces and nephews, Eleanor, is 10 years old as of the fourth. Let us pray. Gracious God, our times are in your hands. Fill these your servants with joy and gladness as they celebrate another year and another year together. Be with them. Fill them with grace and power. Send them from here to proclaim your good news. Amen. May Jesus Christ be manifest in you that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of the one holy and undivided Trinity be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Come now, founts of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet some by flaming tongues above praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart oh take and seal it seal it for thy courts above Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Our warden, Daphne Davies, has an announcement. Be a second. Um, 
a couple of years ago when we were actually all unmasked and here in person, uh, I read to you from one of the lost books of the Bible uh, entitled The Book of Meetings. Um, and uh, it outlined how God will call forth his people, her people, um, at a certain point of the year, usually early in February, uh, and have them sit upon the wooden places where they sit to hear the good news uh, and to proclaim the new leaders of the Grace Church and other churches in the, in the world. Um, uh, unfortunately, I lost the book, uh, so I can't read it uh, to you, uh, but the Lost Book of Meetings has set out that next week we will be having an annual meeting in which we will celebrate all of the good work being done here by uh, our staff, our interim rector, our people, our leaders, our vestry, our program ministry council, and also um, have you vote on the new leaders of Grace Church and listen to the good news, uh, which is about how we are doing financially and think about a new budget for this coming year without which we will not be able to step forth. So the annual meeting calls you to be here with us next week, right after church or as quickly after church as it is practicable. Uh, you are also invited to attend on Zoom if you wish. So we will be having the first annual hybrid in-person and Zoom annual meeting. Please come, we appreciate you being here. I was going to announce that there would be coffee at the meeting. However, I withheld that news, uh, but I will reassure you there shall be coffee at this meeting, which will mean that there will be the first time that we will have had coffee available after church for quite some time, and we'll be sure that we open the doors uh, so there's a lot of ventilation and that we'll be, have everybody be very careful whilst drinking any beverage uh, but and distancing each other uh, whilst savoring their beverage. <laughs> Thank you, Warden Luke, for reminding me. Please stand. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.